This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. Today's episode is sponsored by The Dispatch, your source for unbiased news and commentary informed by conservative principles. Is Donald Trump really going to jail? Does Joe Biden really have what it takes for a second term? Do these questions even matter in the 2024 U.S. election? Get past the bluster and get back to the facts by joining The Dispatch. The Dispatch provides original reporting and commentary on politics, policy, and culture, and it's all informed by conservative principles. Their newsletters and podcasts offer fact-based analysis to help members make sense of the biggest domestic and international stories of the day. The Dispatch has created a home for the politically homeless and provides a needed and welcome sense of humor as their writers explain the news. Reason listeners can try an exclusive 30-day free trial membership. Just click the link in the show notes to join the Dispatch today. My guest is school choice activist Corey DeAngelis, whose provocative new book is The Parent Revolution, Rescuing Your Kids from the Radicals Ruining Our Schools. A senior fellow at the American Federation for Children and a former education policy analyst at the Reason Foundation, Corey has been called the most effective school choice advocate since Milton Friedman. His new book explains why K-12 education failed so badly before and during COVID and how to fix it once and for all by making the needs of parents and students the central concern of schooling. Here is The Reason Interview with Corey DeAngelis. Corey, thanks for talking. Hey, thanks for having me. Okay, you... you hey, Nick, real quick, you called me doctor. The reality uh, is, is I'm not a real doctor. I'm more like a Jill Biden doctor. Okay. That uh, joke never gets old because it's it over never and been over new, and over right? again. Yeah, that is. Um, <laughs> if Trump ask, wins, so I won't is, be able to use it anymore. What is your PhD in? Is it uh, your educa- doctor? education policy at the University of Arkansas. It's actually a department called the Department of Education Reform. So it's not some total Marxist education school like most of them. It's actually uh, my advisors there. One of the journals is called the the Journal of School Choice. is mm-hmm. actually housed at the University mm-hmm. of Arkansas. So uh, my professor at the University of Texas San Antonio, where I did my bachelor's and master's in economics, he was affiliated with uh, the the Friedman Foundation at the time, mm-hmm. now called Ed Choice. And he recommended that I go pursue the PhD at Arkansas. And my first study there actually linked the Milwaukee voucher program started in 1990 to long-term reductions in crime later on in life. Mm -hmm. So uh, that kind of thrust me into the national spotlight for a while. And I'm glad that really quickly I found out that the university was not a friend to me. Um, it It was rough going through the peer review process. And that study in particular, we submitted the the paper. It ultimately got published in a journal called Social Science Quarterly, but that was after going through a lot of the education mm. journals. And one of them was called Urban Education. And one of the journal one of the journal reviewers, after the other one accepted it, the reviewer number two said that, well, you didn't discuss how your results related to whiteness, structural oppression, and power. And then they also were upset that we used the term urban student. And they said, well, students aren't urban. They live in urban areas. And I said, okay, but the reason that we put that in the article is because you're about the journal said urban students. Right. It just goes to show you they, they will try to reject anything that doesn't fit their, their worldview. Uh, if it found a negative result for school choice, you know they would have accepted it right yeah. away. Talk, um, before we get into the book, I guess, proper, um, you mentioned you were uh, uh, raised in San Antonio. You, What was your school experience yeah. as a, you know, as like a grammar school and high school kid? Because that obviously feeds into your interest in school choice policy. Yeah, so if you get a book afterwards, I highly recommend it. It's uh, hit the national bestseller list, and it was recently endorsed by Trump. You might like that. You might not like that. But either way, it mm. uh, it tells you people are talking about it, so you might want to figure out what's, what's in what the book. What did Trump say? He obviously didn't read it, but what did he say about it? I will tell you that mm. Senator Ted Cruz got in an early endorsement on the back, okay. and he says, you can ruin Randy Weingarten's day by reading this book. But explain Trump, who I mean, there's many cognoscenti here. Who is Randy Weingarten? Yeah, so I dedicated the book to Randy Weingarten yeah. too. I, 
And she's the head of the American Federation of Teachers. They fought to keep the schools closed, lobbied the CDC to make it more difficult to reopen schools. They were threatening strikes in 2020. She called the plan to reopen schools by the president reckless, callous, and cruel. They threw every buzzword at the wall to see what would Mm. stick. They were fear-mongering every step of the way. She had local affiliates in Chicago. They were saying that the push to reopen schools is rooted in sexism, racism, and misogyny. They actually deleted a tweet saying that. But I dedicate the book to her at the very front page for overplaying her hand, awakening a sleeping giant, and inadvertently doing more to advance school choice and homeschooling than anyone could have ever imagined. But to get to my schooling experience really quickly, yeah, I grew up in San Antonio, Texas. If you do get a book... And um, did Randy Weingarten steal your lunch money? Is that where this... must? Yeah, I mean, we're coming full circle now. I'm, I'm bringing it back, but... Uh, no, she actually didn't do that. I also did send a book to her. Uh, I also sent one to Chicago Teachers Union boss, yep. Stacey Davis Gates. She called school choice racist last year. And guess what? She sends her own kid to private school. We found out this year. Hmm. Total hypocrisy. Uh, she said it wasn't enough money in the public schools. That was the yep. problem. It wasn't because her unions were pushing for the worst policies ever and protecting the lowest common denominator employee. They spend about $30,000 per kid in the government schools in Chicago. It's not as bad as here. It's $40,000 per kid in New York City. Well, uh, before we uh, get into all of that, what happened to you in high school? Yeah. Yeah. Why why am I so... uh, uh, such a fighter for school? That's what President Trump said. He's a fighter for parental rights. Um, but I went to government schools all through K. Yeah, and I'd like just to kind of clarify this at the beginning. Most of us call them public schools. You insist on the term government schools. What do you why? Yeah, well, what do you if mean you have that? an economist in the room, you know it's not a public good. Schooling is rivalrous and excludable. But more importantly, it's not accessible to the public. Government schools discriminate on the basis of zip code. Families have actually gone to jail for lying about their address to get into better so-called public schools. They're not a public good. They're not accountable to the public. We saw what happened over the COVID era when families weren't happy with what they were seeing in the classroom through Zoom school, through remote learning, which let's be real, we should have called it remotely learning. There wasn't a lot of learning going on. Families weren't happy. So guess what? The unions had told them all along that, well, if you just go show up at the school boards, we'll listen to you. We saw how well that worked out. They tried to bully and silence parents into submission. They cut okay, off their so, mics. I'm sorry. Just And so you call them government schools? Because they're run by the government, operated okay. by the government, regulated by the government. They are compelled by the government. They're assigned by the government. They are funded by the government, or at least the mm-hmm. taxpayer. They're government schools, not public schools. Okay. Um, but to get so, to my experience yeah, this, really quickly. Boy, we, we really, it's like a hot stove. We don't want to touch... What happened to you in public schools? I know, I just keep going and, and all over the place. Schools I went to government Antonio, schools in K-12 to education. And if you get my signature afterwards, you will understand, um, you know, my people were making fun of me online recently. My hmm. handwriting's horrible. You can't blame me. I went to government schools. You can't okay. say it's because I'm a doctor. I'm not a real doctor. I'm a Jill Biden doctor. But I went to government schools K-12. through And in high school, I had the opportunity to go to something called a magnet school. They have magnet schools here in New Mm -hmm. York City, I'm I'm assuming. And it's not, they're still run by the government, but you're not assigned to them. They don't have as much monopoly power. They have to attract their clientele, their customers. They can have a specialized mission. I thought that was a good opportunity for me. I think other families should have similar opportunities as well, but it shouldn't be schools limited to right. ones that are run what by the government. What was the magnet? Uh, what was the special curriculum yeah. at the uh, Yeah, place so we had it? choices among like business careers. My mm-hmm. sister went to something called health careers. Mine was communications arts. Mm. So if I'm talking too mm. much, maybe that's Have they invited the you back or are they kind of like not I don't think they it? like me very, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Um, uh, I, the San Antonio Express News re- Ran one of my op-eds recently, yeah. but I went and talked to the editorial so, board. They weren't too happy with What it. happened, I mean, though, you were, you know, what was your experience and when did you start going to a magnet school? Yeah, I started in ninth grade. So in middle school, went to the government-run school that I was assigned to. And look, it wasn't high expectations. I, I turned out fine, I think. Mm-hmm. You tell me if, if I'm wrong, Nick. But um, Got to there, wait. Yeah, mm-hmm. There was a lot of, you know, gang activity on campus. People would get into fights all the time. Mm. That was the cool thing to do. We would play this game. Raise your hand if you've done this. It was called 10 Seconds. Anybody heard of that game? 
You guys all mm. went to private schools or something. Yeah, I don't know, know. But where I grew up, that was the thing to do. You fought for 10 seconds mm -hmm. and then they'd call it, you know, the third party would yeah. say, okay, that's the end at the end of the timer. And that was it. Um, but people would get rolled into gangs in the bathroom. I don't know if that's a thing anywhere mm. else, but that was a thing at my middle school and drugs were, were rampant on campus as well. So, uh, look, in a, as a libertarian audi audience, drugs yep. are fine, but not it should not be around young children, young impressionable minds. Mm, yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah. No. But I mean, you had. Uh, I mean, it was not, it was not a good environment. Right. Yeah. So I didn't think it was a great environment, but I was on the campus in high school of my assigned school had some of yep. the same problems, and so I saw a night and day difference for four years, mm. and that was a good opportunity for me. I think other families should have opportunities too. But it shouldn't be, again, limited to schools right. that happen to be run by the government. What, uh, what did your parents do? Um, what's their background? And how did, how did they view education? Yeah, my dad actually grew up in Philly. I was just there last mm -hmm. week. He went to a school named called Girard College. Mm -hmm. It was actually, at the time, a school for low-income kids who didn't have fathers. Uh, my dad's dad passed away at eight, when he was eight years old. And so, uh, you know, he was fully covered by a privately funded scholarship there. He had gone to Catholic school before that. They met in San Diego, California. Uh, my dad actually got went into the Air Force. And I was born in Sacramento. Not a lot of people know this. I, I grew up in Texas, but I was actually born in Sacramento. My dad was in the Air Force and we moved around. And I don't know about you guys, but there was a lot of lunacy during the COVID era. Would you agree with me? There was a mm -hmm. lot of stupid rules that didn't make any sense. In Sacramento County, I talk about this in a book as one of the examples there was actually a stupid health order that arbitrarily applied to schools that had to close, but not daycares. Right. Because COVID was smart. It knew if you were learning something, it was going to get you. But if you're just sitting there in the same building, it would it would deactivate and not, not do anything. Same thing with the planes. It was a courteous mm -hmm. virus. If you were eating and you were snacking on pretzels, it would say, oh, I'm going to let you finish your meal before I come attack you. Uh, but there was a private school in Sacramento County during the COVID era, saw all this for what it was, a bunch of BS, and they actually rebranded themselves as a daycare. They mm -hmm. retrained all their employees as daycare workers and said, hey, yeah, we're learning too, but this is really a daycare. And they were able to open their doors for their customers. And that just goes to show you the difference in incentives mm -hmm. that are in the private versus the government sector. Um, let's talk about the title of the book, The Parent Revolution, and you use that you know, that's an organizing principle. Uh, define for us, what is the parent revolution that you're talking about? Yeah, for far too long in K-12 education, the only special interest represented the employees, the adults in the system. But now the kids have a union of their own, their parents. They basically become a new interest group, more of a general interest group. They're fighting for their own kids as opposed to a special interest group like the teachers unions. But they become a political juggernaut, a political force to be reckoned with. And it's all because the unions overplayed their hand by fighting to keep the schools closed for so long. You started to have families who thought things were okay yeah. because they had A ratings on their from the state. The, the kids were getting all A's on their report cards. They thought things were fine. But Vody Bauckham said it best. We cannot continue to send our children to Caesar for their education and be surprised when they come home as Romans. Mm. Well, the good news is parents aren't surprised anymore. One, they saw the unions didn't care about them when they fought to close the schools. But even after the schools were open, families saw through Zoom school that the curriculum wasn't aligned with their values. And the best solution is not from the top down to ban certain concepts or to promote others, because that doesn't get you out of the core root of the problem, which mm -hmm. is we force millions of families to send their kids to a one-size-fits-all government school system that by definition is never going to meet no. the individual varied needs of families. The better solutions from the bottom up. Talk a bit about, you know, let's let before we get to COVID, um, can you do a quick history of school choice yeah. in America? And obviously there's, you know, one story that we tell is that in the mid-50s, Milton Friedman wrote an article, about, you know, where he introduced the idea of, of universal school vouchers. Um, as a more effect, efficient way of kind of parceling out dollars and experiences for schools. Can you take it back a little bit yeah. further? I mean, because yeah. the United States 
has, including before it was the United States, has a kind of unique and strange and kind of wonderful but also disturbing history with education. You know, what's what's the genesis of education in America, of common education? Yeah. And, um, you know, bring us up to COVID in, you know, two minutes. Yeah, look, Milton Friedman's essay was the role of government in education in 1955. He should have really called that the lack of a role of government mm. in education. Um, the, the word education isn't in the, in the federal constitution, the U.S. Constitution. So we should abolish the Department of Education. It never should have been born. It was a well, and it didn't Jimmy exist Carter. when he wrote it. Yeah, I mean, it was, and edu- education then was mostly funded at the state and local level, which is still state yeah. and local governments. But to go back a little bit further than that, we actually had voucher programs in the U.S. in states like Maine and Vermont back in the late 1800s. Uh, these were for students who were assigned to school, were in school districts that were so rural they didn't have any public schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they found out over 150 years ago, not having a lot of opportunities or options was an argument to expand choice, not to restrict it. In some redder states right now, like my home state of Texas, some of the, the Republicans have tried to have their cake and eat it too by saying, well, we can vote against our own party platform because we're in rural areas. The public school is the only option, they'll say, but in the next breath with a straight face, they'll try to tell you, well, this is going to destroy our fantastic rural public school. Hold on. Which mm-hmm. one is it? If you don't have a lot of options, if you're not going to go anywhere else by giving families a choice, but public schools are funded based on enrollment counts, they're not going to lose any money Mm -hmm. at all. But secondly, more importantly, if they're so fantastic, they shouldn't have anything to fear uh, with a little bit of competition. But in the 1930s, we had the father of public education, Horace Mann in the U.S. In the 1830s. Or not 1930s. 1930s. Went over to to modern-day Prussia. And no, but I'm, I'm sorry, it's a 19th century. Horace Mann yeah, is 19th, yeah, 19th century. century. Yep. And so pr- he comes over to the U.S. and he's the first secretary of education in, in, Man- in Ma- Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. And their, their whole idea of the compulsory government school system there was uh, to create obedient soldiers, obedient mm-hmm. factory workers. And so you see a lot of that ideology kind of percolating in the system today. Mm-hmm. That's how it, a lot of people say the school system's failing. We throw more money at it over time. Since 1970, per student spending has increased by 170% in real terms. The academic outcomes haven't gotten better, but maybe we're looking at the wrong outcomes. It's more about control and obedience to authority. You have to raise your hand whenever you want to do anything in the school system. And that's why I'm a big proponent of homeschooling too. Mm -hmm. And homeschooling has at least doubled relative to pre-pandemic levels as well. So that's another silver lining of when the government closed the schools, families started to, a lot of them didn't like the the Zoom school at home, but Mm -hmm. others who might not have tried homeschooling before said, hey, this is something I can do. Mm -hmm. They had more confidence in in their ability to do so. And uh, they started to realize they can learn a lot more at a fraction of the, in the Mm -hmm. fraction of the time. And as far as socialization is concerned, uh, they were able to cut out a lot of those negative forms of socialization Mm -hmm. that I experienced in my government schools uh, growing up. And they were able to capitalize on positive forms of socialization. Can you talk, you know, we kind of go from Horace Mann in the middle of the 19th century um, and, you know, the the beginning of compulsory schooling um, to, you know, in the early 20th century and particularly as immigrants were coming in, the public schools took on a certain uh, kind of heroic cast, right? Because they were assimilating, you know, the children of immigrants and things like that. What's wrong with that? Because even even people like Milton Friedman would kind of wax nostalgic about how public schools in the teens and 20s helped Americanize people like him uh, and whatnot. What, they're, you know? they're not actually doing that. I mean, you have a lot of polarization right now politically. And guess what? 90 percent of kids are in government schools today. Mm hmm. Um, maybe that has something to do with a lot of the divisiveness that we see in society today. If your school is not doing a good job teaching academics and they're teaching kids to to not like each other based on immutable characteristics with Marxist ideology, that could be a problem. And so you start to attack each other with ad hominem as opposed mm. to just saying, hey, you, you might be a good person. I just disagree with you based on X, Y, Z. I think your logic mm. is fault flawed. I, say, I think too many cases, if you're not getting a good education, you're going to attack people's mm. Uh, motives as opposed and them as a human being as opposed to just mm-hmm. their arguments. So what happened in the fifties? Uh, why did, uh, why did Friedman start talking about school choice? I mean, he had uh, Brown versus board of education. Mm-hmm. And so 
actually, and anybody know Phil Magnus? Mm-hmm. He had a sure. he had a good article in the Wall Street Journal called "School Choices: Anti-Racist History." Mm-hmm. So some people claim that school choice is rooted in in segregation, and people were trying to get away from the desegregated government-run schools, mm-hmm. and they wanted to flee to private schools. Well, guess what? In the 1950s, in Virginia at least, Phil Magnus talks about this in the Wall Street Journal. The teachers' unions actually locked arms with staunch segregationists to block school vouchers mm-hmm. because they knew that private school choice would lead to more racial integration as opposed to segregation because the public schools are already so racially segregated. And Mm -hmm. if you look at the evidence that we have today, there's eight studies on this topic. Seven of them find overall that school choice leads to more racial integration Mm -hmm. as opposed to segregation. Why, Why does it do that? Because the government schools are already so segregated by zip code and that reflects race and income and other factors too. And so school choice is an equalizer. The, the families who are able to afford private school tuition and fees as, uh, right now are the most advantaged families. And so if you give the, the funding to the parents, we spend about $20,000 on average in the U.S. Mm-hmm. per student per year. Average private school tuition and fees is only about twelve dollars to $13,000 mm-hmm. per student year per year nationally. If you give that money to the parents, even if you give them half, $10,000, you can save taxpayer money, but you can also allow for more families to access opportunities who wouldn't have had those opportunities before. Could you talk a little bit about the history of Catholic schools in all of this? Because, you know, Catholic schools were, and I guess they still are the largest kind of single type of private school up through about 1960 when people started, uh, you know, leaving cities uh, in big numbers. Catholic schools were an important kind of competitive alternative to uh, public schools in cities um, what's going on with that yeah. now? So the, the government-run schools were de facto Protestant schools mm-hmm. a long time ago. So the Catholics set up their own schools. And that's, so, that's why today you have the, I mean, I think it's about half of all the private religious schools are Catholic schools. Mm-hmm. And they tend to be lower cost. They've been around for a, long, uh, for a while. They're subsidized by church donations mm-hmm. and, and, and other revenue sources as well and endowments. And so those are that's that's why most of them exist, uh, why so many of them exist today. Uh, and then there there was a, an attempt to to try to fight back against the Catholic schools with the Blaine Amendment. So mm-hmm. most states have something called a Blaine Amendment, where they tried to pass this in Congress to prevent any of the public school funding to go to the Catholic schools that had been set up. And so when they met American, they met you know they, they basically wanted they didn't want you to be Catholic immigrants. Right. They, you, know, you wanted to assimilate to be Protestant. Um, and so they didn't have the votes in Congress. And so they started pushing these bills in different state legislatures and they were able to pass them in uh, more than 30 states. And most recently, uh, we've had a couple of, of good Supreme Court cases in 2020 and in 2022 that basically dealt a mortal blow to the Blaine Amendments. And they, ba- they most recently said, one, school choice is not a violation of the Establishment Clause. Some people will say it's a separation of church and state issue, but it's not for the same reason that Pell Grants can be used at religious universities. Pre-K programs with state funding can be used at religious pre-Ks because the funding primarily benefits the family or the student, Mm -hmm. and then you can choose religious or non-religious providers. Same thing with Medicaid vouchers, basically, for hospitals. You can use those, if you want, at religiously affiliated hospitals, and no one says this is a violation Mm -hmm. of the Establishment Clause. It's not um, establishing a state religion. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the 2022 2022 Carson v. Macon and 2020 Montana v. Espinoza case they both ruled that, one, uh, they reminded everybody this is not a violation of the Establishment mm-hmm. Clause, but two, if you're going to have a school choice initiative, you can't exclude religious schools from benefiting mm-hmm. because that would be a violation of the Free Exercise Clause, and it would also be, a fourth, I would argue, mm-hmm. a 14th Amendment issue. Um, let's talk a bit about the parent revolution and the way that you anchor it to the COVID experience. So, I mean, there have, there have been experiments, uh, you know, more or less robust, more or less explicit with school choice from the beginning, including a lot of people leaving, you know, cities or, or moving from one town to another because of, you know, the, the perceived quality of public schools. 
Um, let's walk through how COVID really supercharged, just poured gasoline on school choice. Yeah. We're winning so much, I'm almost getting tired of winning. Hmm. Not yet. We haven't gotten in New York yet. We can talk a little bit later about how we bring school choice to bluer areas, mm -hmm. union-controlled areas. But look, before 2021, we had zero states with Milton Friedman's vision of universal school choice. What do I mean by that? Every single family in states like Arizona, they were one of the first movers, can now take their child's state portion of education dollars to the education provider of their choosing. No more picking winners and losers. Mm -hmm. It's regardless of income, background, zip code, every family can take that money to and a how public much, school. How much want. is that? It's about 7000 in Arizona, half of the total. They spend about $14,000 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. per student. So it's usually state portion is half. And These they are, can use that to go to a school. They can use it to take trips. They can, I mean, it's, Homeschooling, mm -hmm. it's, it can't be used for drugs. Okay. You can't do that. So you could, it has to be used for education pretty broadly defined. Yes, right. you, I'm sure you can make it. How many, work. well, how many people, uh, you know, how many families or how many kids are participating in? In Arizona, uh, actually, when they opened the floodgates in 2022, they broke the government website. Now you can say it's mm. because it was a government website. Mm. We didn't know at first. Is there actually a lot of people using this? When the data came in, they went from, they had an existing program of about 10,000 kids. Right after that past 2022, we now fast forward to today having about 80,000 kids using mm. the program. So this is why the unions are so terrified of competition. Mm. They know that families are going to flock to these opportunities when given the choice. But in places like Arizona, yeah, you could take that money to the assigned school if you want. If you like mm -hmm. your public school, you can keep your public school for mm -hmm. real this time. And like with your doctor, the public schools, believe it or not, they do get better. They up their game mm -hmm. in response to competition. Most studies find that 26 of 29 find more school choice. It's a rising tide that lifts all boats. The public schools actually do get a little better. It's not extremely better, mm -hmm. but it's still... But it's it's the opposite of what every, it's Everybody ups their game. Right. I mean, the, 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 the claim by the other side is going to destroy the public schools. And if a little bit of competition is going to destroy your uh, institutions, maybe you deserve to die. Hmm. Uh, but that's not actually what happens. Right. They do get better. And so we've had 12 states now going universal on school choice. Again, you might say that's only 12 states, but that's 12 states. And that's uh, all. I mean, Arizona started down this road in 2011, but then it jacked up over the past couple of years. And yep. are all of the other states that have joined, are they all kind of post-COVID or during the COVID yep. era? 2021 was the first. It was actually West Virginia, mm -hmm. Arizona. Um, I would say passed a better policy in 2022 that was immediately universal. West Virginia, a lot of people say Arizona's first because they got to universal first. But West Virginia in 2021 passed the bill that became universal after a couple of years. And was this mostly, you know, parents when schools got shut down and everything shifted to, you know, remote learning, people just looking and being like, I can't believe this or. Yeah. I mean, I think it had a lot to do with the values misalignment. And again, mm -hmm. some red states have taken one approach to, to ban certain concepts. And I, I don't think that's. It look if, if you if you if you don't like the concept that is a step in the right direction. It's unenforceable though. I mean these are governments; they're not accountable. And so what we've seen in states like my home state of Texas and Idaho and Iowa and Tennessee, a lot of red states, they've banned CRT, for example. And explain that's critical race, critical theory. race theory. What, what what's divides the students for that? into to oppressors and the oppressed? And a lot of people might even disagree on what the definition is. This is mm -hmm. another part of the problem. You might teach something through a critical race theory lens that might actually be okay to some parents, mm -hmm. whereas when you see kids getting separated by their race in, in class mm -hmm. and then doing, having to do the privilege walks and, and stuff like that, families aren't happy with those things. Now, mm -hmm. is that defined as critical race theory? Mm -hmm. A lot of people disagree on what that definition is. But do, do you think is. it was mostly a values misalignment where yeah. people were looking and I, like, I don't recognize what ki my kids are being yeah. taught? And it wasn't about, you know, God, they're not learning any math. They're not learning how to no, read. No, because the advantaged families already, th their kids were still fine mm -hmm. for the most part. And so for, for a long time, we did make the argument for school choice, which is a good argument that there are kids who are stuck in objectively failing schools based on math and reading test scores. Mm -hmm. But the school choice movement wasn't ratcheting up a lot of wins with Democrats. This wasn't translating to victories mm -hmm. in terms of Democrats actually voting for it. 
Unfortunately, as everybody in the room knows, politicians respond more to power than, than logic or morality. Mm -hmm. And so we could hit them over the head with these with data points and arguments from the left and the right, and they weren't voting mm -hmm. for it. Well, school choice kind of changed that with COVID because one, it did expose a lot of the rot with academics not doing really well, but also more importantly, it mobilized parents because they thought their kids are being brainwashed for 13 mm -hmm. years of their lives for seven hours a day uh, in values that were not aligned with their own. Mm -hmm. So that got parents really upset. And they tried to go back to the school board meetings with this fairy tale model of democratic accountability that actually does not work in practice. It's not true accountability. And we all saw that right before our eyes. And families were labeled as domestic terrorists by the National School Boards Association, which sent a letter to Biden mm -hmm. implying that under the Patriot Act of all things, parents should be investigated for quote unquote domestic terrorism. Get this, an earlier version of that letter that wasn't circulated publicly, actually called for the military to be deployed to school board meetings, the National Guard to be deployed to school board meetings to bully and silence parents into submission. Uh, but the, the, the sign of hope is that families were only emboldened to push back mm. even harder, and 26 states have since left the National School Boards Association. What is the National School Boards Association? <laughs> Who knows what benefit they actually provide. Mm -hmm. And maybe that some states started, well, we don't actually need them very much. They provide lobbying assistance at the federal mm -hmm. level. And so a lot of the state school boards and the local school boards will, will, are, were part of the National School Boards Association. Um, so, you know, in the states that really pushed kind of a universal school choice approach, where and I, I guess, does it often work in lockstep that they create education savings accounts or something like that, where you can take a large chunk of money and spend it how you see fit. Do they also tend to increase the number of charter schools or liberalize homeschooling laws? So charter schools that were already legal before, you know, in like 47 right. states. So charter schools. Kinda, but they can be, there's more or less, right? There are more yeah, or there's more or less and there's tweaks to the laws. Like in Virginia, yeah. they have seven charter schools because McDonald's has to approve every Burger King opening up. The school mm -hmm. district has to approve every charter school that opens up. Of course, they're not no. going to approve the good, their good competition because they don't want to lose any money. Uh, which is also interesting in, in Pennsylvania and in California, I believe, when the government schools closed and they were failing with Zoom school, they started lobbying the government and they were successful in Pennsylvania and California, probably other states too. They prevented the funding from following students to virtual charter schools. Hmm. It showed you it had nothing to do with safety. They even admitted it was, hey, we don't want yeah. to lose any money. We're closed. Um, we don't know how to do Zoom school. The virtual charters have been doing this for decades. Families realized that, but then they got blocked because so many mm -hmm. um, families wanted it. I mean, it, it's just sh sheer protectionism. Before we continue with the Reason interview, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Students for Liberty. Students for Liberty is a rapidly growing network of pro-liberty students from all over the world with hundreds of active chapters on all six inhabited continents. They educate young people about the philosophy of liberty in two ways by helping them learn about the principles of a free society, and by identifying those who are already supportive of liberty and providing them with resources to spread the ideas. This isn't about providing advanced education regarding the nuances of libertarian theory. They aim to provide a basic education to as many people as possible on the meaning of liberty and key values of classical liberalism. Students for Liberty also develops the leadership skills of those young people who support liberty, helping them to be more effective organizers, managers, writers, speakers, and overall better leaders today and tomorrow. Students for Liberty empowers students and alumni to make the world a freer place. Please visit studentsforliberty.org. That's studentsforliberty.org to see how you can join in and support their efforts. And now, Back to the Reason interview. As long as we're talking about Virginia, you spend a good chunk of time and there's a kind of breakdown of how the gubernatorial race between Glenn Youngkin and Terry McAuliffe kind of is, a, is you know, the paradigmatic example of how education choice became central to a gubernatorial race that then followed through. Can you talk, walk us through yeah. that? Anybody remember Terry? I don't think parents should be telling schools that they should teach yeah. McAuliffe from Virginia. 
He was in a state that went 10 points to Biden just the year before. The former governor of Virginia, mm -hmm. basically an incumbent, he lost to Glenn Youngkin by six points with education voters. A Republican, a Republican winning mm -hmm. on the issue of education. And guess what? That was the number two issue in that election. Education is usually at the bottom of the list of priorities. Mm -hmm. But after that gaffe or him letting the, the mask slip, right. Terry McAuliffe, on the final debate stage, Glenn Youngkin was smart. He turned that into an attack ad on McAuliffe. And Terry, he didn't back away from his anti-parent mm -hmm. rhetoric. He kind of quadrupled down up until election night where he had Randy Weingarten, of all people, stumping for him the mm -hmm. night before the election. The, the school closer was his campaign closer. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it works out for him. Mm -hmm. It didn't work out for him. And a Virginia mom even went on CNN the next day and said that that was the nail in the coffin moment for her. And so Leonkin basically laid out a blueprint for political success for Republicans mm -hmm. to talk about school choice and education policy in a, in a wide umbrella of parental rights and education. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to argue with that position, you got to basically take the far socialist position that you believe kids belong to the government mm. and that parents shouldn't be in the driver's seat. It puts them on defense and Terry just did not know how to handle it. And so what did he do? He just kept quadrupling down uh, with the unions as opposed to the mm. parents. And I think that has led to some Republicans leaning into the issue, trying to become mm -hmm. the parents party. Mm -hmm. And it's become more of a GOP litmus test issue. If you think about Tennessee, 10 of the Republicans running for house in the Tennessee primaries in 2022 were endorsed or funded by the teachers unions. Nine of them lost. Hmm. It became a, a form of political suicide, uh, a, a, the political kiss of death to accept the teachers union endorsement post COVID as a Republican. In my home state of Texas, our, our Senate passed universal school choice last year. Um, it moved over to the house where he had a Republican majority. And 21 of the Republicans voted with all the Democrats against their mm. own party platform to kill school choice, to side with the status quo. 18 of those guys were already endorsed by the state affiliate of the NEA. But out of the 21, 14 of them are gone. Mm. And so Republicans usually win their reelection 95% of the time. That trend was inverted yep. in Texas. And look, in, in 2022, there wasn't a red wave. We all were talking about mm -hmm. the red wave. That didn't really happen. There wasn't a blue wave, but there was a school choice wave. This didn't mm. just happen in Texas and Tennessee. Nationally, my group targeted 69 incumbents. What is your group? The American Federation for Children, right. not the Reason Foundation. It's yeah. a separate organization. I am a senior fellow at the Reason Foundation. Sure. We um, only have senior fellows, though. Yeah. I just want to point that out. Um, you know, explain, you know, it's, it's easy to understand the teachers' unions as a political force because in almost every state, <clears throat> School teachers are either the single biggest block of employees or close to it. And then, you know, they have families and things like that. It's easy to understand how they can bring a lot of money and a lot of power and a lot of intensity to things. Who are the parents just kind of loosely affiliated or, you know, what what's happening there? Like, how do they show up en masse uh, and vote in a particular I mean, way. Moms for Liberty is one group. I came out to mm -hmm. New York City a couple months ago and spoke at one of their events. And Maude, are you here? Yep, she mm -hmm. spoke there as well. Thanks for coming. Uh, <laughs> I got one with me. Thanks, thanks mm -hmm. for being here. Uh, but look, parents thought they were powerless before. And so if you, it's a coordination problem. Economists mm -hmm. in the room are really familiar with this. But uh, this is why special interests usually get what they want. They're coordinated mm -hmm. and they have a lot of funding. But parents, even though there's more of them, they're dispersed. It's a dispersed cost to have the status quo. Well, Moms for Liberty and other groups like that have shown parents that they have a support group, basically. Mm -hmm. If they stick their neck out, we're going to come to defend you. You're not going to be the only one showing up at the school board meeting. Mm -hmm. And social media has helped with that, too, uh, where you kind of you can have your social group, even if it's not an in-person group, where where people will support you when you go out and fight back at the school board meetings or in other arenas as well. But parents have also fought back just at the ballot box. Mm -hmm. And school choice, again, has become a GOP litmus test issue. And some Democrats are coming along too, mm -hmm. which, is, uh, which is a welcome change. In chapter four, I coin a term I call, uh, a phrase I call bipartisanship or nonpartisanship through hyperpartisanship. 
It might sound counterintuitive at first. Yeah, I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, so how can something so politically polarizing in the short run turn into something that is more nonpartisan mm-hmm. in the medium to long term? Well, it has all to do with the reality of what I pointed out earlier, that politicians don't really care all that much about logic or morality. They care about power and mm-hmm. politics. And so you got to hit them where it hurts at the ballot box. And with the more that the GOP leans into parental rights as a political winner, I don't care which party it is. If there's one party that's a first mover on the issue and it's popular among voters, mm-hmm. Republican, Democrat, and independent, well, then the elected officials on the other side will feel pressure to to follow through as well. And we're seeing some of the things that I called in the book happening in real life right now. One thing that I did include in the book was Josh Shapiro in Pennsylvania. In 2022, he was up by double digits in the polls. His opponent, Doug Mastriano, started calling him a hypocrite. He said, hey, I support school choice. You went to private school. Why don't you support it too? Josh Shapiro was politically smart in one way in that he changed his education platform to include private school choice. Mm-hmm. He even said a, a Lifeline Scholarships was what's the name of a bill that was one, run by a Republican that year. And so that a high profile Democrat felt compelled mm-hmm. to signal support for, for private school choice was is good news. As Milton Friedman once famously said, the way that you change things is not about getting the right people into office. The way that you truly change things is by creating a climate mm-hmm. of opinion where it becomes politically profitable for the wrong people to do the right thing. And so Josh Shapiro might have been looking over to Terry McAuliffe and saying, I don't want Mm. that to happen to me. He was up in the polls too. And then J.B. Pritzker, deep blue Illinois, he sucks for a lot of reasons. But, I mean, three weeks before the election, he answered a candidate survey saying he would support the same program and saving Mm. the scholarship program the same one that he vowed to eliminate that he first, mm. when he first ran for office in 2017. Now, the program got nixed last year in Illinois, but he did respond to the Chicago Tribune again last year saying, if a bill got to his desk, he would sign it to save the program. He probably knew that bill was mm. never going to make it to his desk, but that's not my point. Yeah. I wasn't writing those articles in the journal to say you should go vote for these people. The reason was is to try to put a spotlight on it to try to keep the keep them uh, to hold their word, and if they don't, have some political ramifications are, for them in the future for lying. Are schools of choice better than residential assignment schools, or or how do you measure that, or is that the right criterion? Look, I don't even. The preponderance of the evidence suggests that private and charter schools do more with less money. They get better academic outcomes. Even when you're looking at the lottery-based studies in in New York City, there's a study published in Journal of Political Economy by Dobby and Fryer, and they found that winning a lottery, so it's like a medical trial, you can compare the winners Mm -hmm. to the losers of the lottery, and you can say that the students are basically the same on all background demographic Mm -hmm. characteristics on average. They found that winners of the lottery for male students, they had a complete elimination through the study period of the likelihood of incarceration. And so the, the control group, the losers of the lottery, about four or five percent of them were incarcerated through the study period. Zero percent of the lottery winners. For female students, they found about a 59 percent reduction in the likelihood of teenage pregnancies. And so the reason I bring up these other types mm-hmm. of outcomes, too, is that parents are choosing schools for a lot of different reasons. Mm-hmm. And test scores, that's just one part of the equation. Families want to get their kid in a safe environment. They want uh, their kid in an environment that's aligned with their values. And test scores and academics are part of the the, the Because I I was uh, in preparing for this, I looked at Wallet Hub, which is not necessarily the the greatest source of anything, but they ranked school outcomes. And states like Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey have really high performing public schools based on, you know, they use 33 criteria, uh, including ACT scores and how many schools in the you know are ranked in the top quarter of this or that, and then states with a lot of school choice like Arizona and Florida and Nevada do kind of poorly. So, I mean, how do you how do you address yeah. like is the ultimate kind of marker of school choice is it parental satisfaction um, or is it test scores or how do how do you kind of quantify? I think it's all of the above, right? I mean, mm-hmm. it's it's based on what the parent wants, right? It shouldn't be based on some average test score. Then also, if you look at the data out of Florida, 
the Urban Institute has something called uh, the America's Grade Book. And so you can plug in controls for different demographics mm -hmm. of students across states. And then once you do that in Florida, sure. despite them spending far less than the national average, they're ranked in the top five to, mm. for a whole host of different mm. outcomes academically uh, after controlling for differences in students. And they do have a lot of school choice. And they've also mm. found there have been 11 studies in Florida on the topic, 10 of them positive, more school choice, better outcomes mm -hmm. in the public schools. And just think about it over time. In Florida, they were at the bottom of the pack on the nation's report card a couple decades ago. Mm -hmm. Fast forward to today, as they've expanded school choice, they've gotten a lot better. And then the latest study on this is actually out of Florida by David Figlio and his research team in the American Economics Journal, a top economics mm -hmm. journal, finding again, more school choice, better outcomes in the public schools. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, this isn't really public versus private or government versus private. This isn't parent versus teacher. It's about pro-freedom, pro-choice, mm -hmm. and and families having the opportunity to choose. And you might be in a school that's high-rated school, you're getting good test scores, but if you're being bullied each day, mm -hmm. and your mental health isn't in the right space, and your friends are at another institution, Families should be able to choose to go somewhere else. So it, it's quality is not one size fits all either. And it differs yeah. based on it's just like I, I, I mean, I think that's, you know, really key to the, the way that you talk about it in a way that I find very uh, appealing. Um, I was looking at uh, I guess these are uh, uh, National Center for Educational Statistics uh, or uh, parental satisfaction for people with kids in private school. So this is where kids are actually going was 81%, 63% for charter schools, which are public schools of choice, 61% for choice schools within a district setting, so that's more like magnet schools, and 56 for uh, people who are just assigned to a school based on location. So there, you know, it does seem like there's some broad correlation with people liking to be able to choose yeah. where their kids go to school. Yeah, and there's tons of evidence on it. There's like 30 or so studies on linking yeah. private school choice to satisfaction, all finding improvements. Um, now, you are really, uh, and we'll get to uh, uh, questions in about five minutes, but um, you, know, you, you are very hardcore in a way. A lot of school reformers are not. You might have particular points of view about things like CRT or various kinds of curricula, but the idea is that, you know, schools should be as varied and as, you know, experimenting and innovating all over the place. Does that put you in the minority of a lot of school reformers who oftentimes will say, well, we know how to teach reading, we know how to teach math, we know what good values are, and we should be enforcing that at the highest level possible so that everybody is learning the same thing? Yeah, more from the bottom up, hmm. right? So yeah, there are some people who think they know better than others, and maybe they're right, but that's not, I mean, you can push those views all you want, right? And you should, if you if you have what you think is the right idea. Um, and if you want to push that into the public school system, fine. But at the end of the day, I'm more of a thousand flowers bloom kind of guy. Mm -hmm. And I see schools basically as an extension of parenting. And I think this is why this battle is so important, because you have typically a special interest, the minority, a, a teacher's union, mm -hmm. controlling the minds of other people's children. And you can't beat that problem and shape the direction of our country just by outpopulating the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, because they're, the government schools educate 50 or so million kids a year for 13 years of their lives for seven hours a day. Those kids are going to turn out to vote for socialist policies in the future. If they're learning that big government is the solution to all their problems. If you don't care about education policy, you should, because let's say you care about tax policy. They're going to vote to raise your taxes later on in life. But if they hate school, aren't they going to vote against it? I mean, this you're you're making the case that Cubans who escape well, Castro I mean, come here and vote for socialism. I mean, their their teachers might be telling them though that the, the school sucks so bad because yeah. we don't have enough money, yeah. so you, we got to raise taxes. And maybe. I It'll do be just put a point on that for people. You know, we're in New York City, in New York State. Uh, currently, the uh, the state says they spend about thirty thousand dollars per pupil. In 1970, that was, and this is in inflation-adjusted terms, it was 17,000. So Triple. New York State, and there's a wide variation between school districts, but for 30K a year, you you know, 
we could be doing a lot better. And the charter schools, they get like 80% of the funding of mm-hmm. what they spend in the government yeah. run schools. And in New York City, you have a charter school cap that arbitrarily limits competition. Right. You got tens of thousands of kids on wait lists each year to try to get into better charter schools. And the status quo doesn't doesn't care. What's interesting actually is during the election of Ka- uh, uh, your governor, Kathy Hochul. Kathy, um, during the Kathy final, Hochul. Hochul. We, we're not on a first name yeah, basis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why didn't she show up? Is she's trying yeah. to improve education. But she actually, during the final debate, it was Zeldin she was running against. Right? Mm-hmm. So Zeldin, yeah. all in on school choice. They both answered in the affirmative that they would support a, a lift of the charter school cap. Mm-hmm. Has she done anything to really pass that? Mm-hmm. Maybe she doesn't have the votes. Let me, know, um, heard much we're going to, can we set the mic stand up? Uh, and we're going to ask one more question, then we'll go to audience Q&A. And you can please, uh, when uh, Hunt puts it up here, if you can line up, uh, you can start lining up. Um, one of the things uh, uh, I know, uh, both as a property owner as well as somebody who grew up in New Jersey in a town that had very high uh, school taxes and things like that, people people consider the value of their house very much tied to the perceived quality of school districts. Um, it's also a way, you know, the, of keeping certain people out and things like that. Is that connection, the idea that, well, we have good schools here and we spend a lot of money on them, which raises taxes, which makes it more expensive, which keeps it nice. Um, is that starting to fray the association between home value and the quality of the school district? Yeah, especially because the you know the definition of quality varies now, and it's more about values than about standardized test scores. Mm-hmm. So I think that's part of the, the the new coalition that's been fighting for school choice is families who are politically mo- um, powerful, who could afford to live in the best school districts, were saying that these schools aren't that good either. Mm-hmm. And so we've had more of a broader coalition pushing for school choice, and politics is all about organized interest pushing for what they want. And when you're only saying that certain families, low-income families and failing school districts are benefiting, well, that wasn't as compelling um, to to voters who thought that things were okay before. So now you have a much broader coalition. I think that's been why so many politicians are being held accountable yeah. right now. And it's, I choice. looked at, I mean, there are a wide variety of uh, surveys and, and whatnot, but school choice support, and this is for universal vouchers, 60% of blacks uh, support universal vouchers, 60% of Hispanics, 60% of whites, um, which is kind of fascinating because when people start to say, well, this is a plot to disenfranchise racial or ethnic minorities or whatever, it's like there's a broad-based support across all groups. I mean, look at the D.C. voucher program that Biden doesn't support. He's a hypocrite yeah. on the issue. He went to private school, sent his kids to private school, and then tries to pull up the ladder from behind himself to fight mm. against education freedom for others. But in D.C., the voucher program out there, it's only about a third of what you would get in the government schools. It's 10000 per kid in scholarship mm-hmm. money. Each year, they have thousands of kids on the wait list to get into that program. And despite it spending a, a, a costing a third of what they spend in the government schools, and 95% of the kids are black or Hispanic, and the mm-hmm. average household income of students using that program from a, the most, most recent data that I've seen is only about $30,000 mm-hmm. a year. It might be higher now, but in DC, that's a pretty low number for an entire household. Yep. And um, the, a little story that I include in the book about Florida is that, look, DeSantis won by 20 points in 2022, so you might not remember in 2018, he barely won by a fraction of a point against Andrew Gillum, a Democrat. And the story there in the headline in the Wall Street Journal the next day was that school choice moms tipped the governor's Mm -hmm. race in Florida. CNN exit polling found that DeSantis overperformed with black women in particular because his opponent, Andrew Gillum, called to get rid of the scholarship program that was benefiting over 100,000 families at the time disproportionately low-income families and disproportionately Hmm. non-white families as well. So a lot of the families who might not have agreed with DeSantis on a whole host of other issues turned education into a voting priority, and they showed up in force for DeSantis. And so... Yeah, and that um, was a very tight... uh, uh, Yeah, you uh, write about how uh, he owed his first victory to 100,000 black women who voted for him 
in which was odd for a Republican yeah. to get that kind of support. Okay, let's start with questions. Um, please just ask a question. Don't uh, comment on how well quaffed Corey is or <laughs> how much you know the the food before was wonderful or things. But please just <laughs> ask a question. Thank you. He's like, shoot, I didn't have. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Tom Dilling, and my last name comes from my hometown in Germany. And I wanted to know uh, what you think the role of a public school is in forming that identity, because it was so important to my ancestors. How how is it important to the students who go to a home, uh, who have a, a unified public school in their hometown, versus you know one student goes to Coca Cola public uh, private school here, and someone down the street goes to Pepsi. Public, Thank you. Uh, that's that's a great question. Yeah, I would say, look, uh, this is some of the argument you hear uh, in the rural opposition to school choice. So they'll say it's the lifeblood of our community. It's so important to our community. It's to have the, the crucible team. of American it's, democracy. It's, yeah, it's, it, it is the bedrock of democracy. And my response to that is if you like your public school, you can keep it. But for real, uh, if it's so important to have your identity tied to the government school system, Go have at it. You should still have that option. School choice bills don't abolish the government school system altogether. It does actually improve them. But I don't know how much that's actually the case. It's it's the theory, right? But mm -hmm. in, in practice, it doesn't seem like, you know, there's, there's, there's so many negatives associated with the government school system. And that's why they fight so hard against school choices. They know a lot of families aren't happy with, the, with what they're getting. Do you condition, do you put any conditions on taxpayer money that goes to education, whether directly or indirectly to parents? So, yeah. you know, um, I mentioned could, drugs yeah. earlier. I said no drugs. But, right. OK. Um, so, I'm out. yeah, I mean, look, the, the, you got to you got to pass these things. right? Yeah. You got to make it politically palatable. And I, I as a libertarian, I'm actually an anarcho capitalist philosophically, okay. uh, I've pushed for the least amount of red tape right. as possible. And I would point to Arizona as being the model. They have no required standardized testing. No, um, they, you can't, the government can't tell you what your curriculum ought to mm -hmm. be. Basically all they have is a random audit each year to make sure you're spending the money on education loosely defined to make sure mm -hmm. you're not buying big screen TVs and, and drugs and other things like okay. that. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, in New York City during the pandemic, there was there were a lot of educational activists here in New York City who were looking to change and devalue merit and remake the public school system. Um, and a hundred, I noticed at this time that a hundred percent of them were people who either didn't have kids or had their kids in in private school or had had their kids in screen public schools, and then as you say, pulled up the ladder. And, and my idea is that shame could be a powerful motivator <laughs> because how else are you going to change the educational system in a deep blue city like New York City yeah. unless you expose the people for their hypocrisy? Thank you. Yeah. Look, I would say, uh, yes, shame them. Um, mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a logically oriented person, like I got into this as an academic of sorts, I thought if I just hit people on the head with a book full of data that they were going to vote for my mm. policy and it was going to, that's important. You got to have data and the facts on your side, but you have to also incentivize people through human nature and shaming them publicly and calling out hypocrisy. I pull no punches in this book. Every time I re reference an opponent, it seems that 99% of the time I also mention, well, they sent their kids to private school too. Yeah. Uh, including Stacey Davis effective? Gates and Joe is, Biden. Is that effective? I mean, I mean I, it is with vote. It's not going to get them to vote for right. it, but it'll tell voters maybe I don't like this person very much. And we've done polling at this nationally with real clear opinion research. Just ask people, uh, American voters, if you found out that someone um, on the ballot voted against school choice, but then sent their own kid to private school, mm. would you be more or less likely to vote for them? Uh, surprise, surprise. Yeah. They overwhelmingly said, they'd be a lot less likely to vote for them. So, But to, to your second part of your question, how do you get uh, school choice done in a deep blue state? My more hopeful kind of long-term strategy is, is this bipartisanship through hyperpartisanship that everybody starts to come along, starts to listen to the kids' union, the parents, as opposed to the teachers' union, but it's going to require one party becoming the first mover if they start to win at the ballot box 
even at the mm -hmm. margins, you'll have some defectors on the Democrat side. This happened in North Carolina and in Georgia. They had sitting legislators on the Democrat side actually flip to the GOP on the issue of school choice. Uh, you think about, I mentioned uh, Illinois, I mentioned Pennsylvania already, uh, Louisiana. They just mm -hmm. became the 12th state to pass universal school choice. They didn't need a single Democrat vote in their House. They still passed it with super majorities. But guess what? 20% of their Democrats voted for the bill mm -hmm. the first time it was called. So one of the Democrats pointed out, like, I don't need this job. I don't need the teachers union support. This is mm -hmm. too important. So that was a heroic move by Representative Jason Hughes, a Democrat in in uh, Louisiana, in Nebraska. They need two thirds supermajority to end a filibuster there because they have a unicameral mm -hmm. one chamber. They need 33 votes to get anything done. They had a vote from Justin Wayne, one of the mm -hmm. Democrats who went viral, calling out his his colleagues for being hypocrites on the issue of school choice. So I think that's the long term strategy. You have more of these laboratories of democracies mm -hmm. uh, engaging in competition to empower parents. Maybe some blue blue states come along. Maybe some blue states become red states, and maybe just some Democrats defect on the issue. In the the shorter term. There's a tax credit scholarship that is proposed at the federal level called the Educational Choice for Children Act. It has 140 co-sponsors in the House. Speaker Mike Johnson's mm. signed on to it as well. And it's a tax credit. It's not government money following the child. And every family could choose whether to get a tax benefit from the federal level for using expenses mm. for K-12 education. So that's Next uh, question. And make it a question. Uh, so my question is, why is it so important that school choice be universal? And maybe this is a common question you get, but, you know, from many people's perspective, it's like before, you know, rich families who are sending their kids to private schools anyway, were paying property taxes, but they're paying out of their own pocket. Now they're getting, you know, thousands of dollars to send it. So, so is this really the best use of sort of taxpayer money? Yeah, no one should have to pay twice. No one should have to, to pay once for the government schools through tax systems and then not get any money back to pay for private school tuition and fees. We don't restrict access to government schools based on income. We don't say Bill Gates can't go to the government school. We'll still spend money to pay for him to go there. So at least families should get the average amount back. If they're paying more than the average into the tax system. They should get at least some of it back. And then the side benefit there is a political one where if you have more people benefiting, you again, you create a broader coalition to to advance the policy and to keep it around. In Illinois, we kind of mentioned this on the side that they got rid of their program. It was a low income targeted program and it was on the chopping block. But my theory is if you had a much larger population, but also a wider range of families benefiting, they would fight harder to keep it, which would also benefit the kids who lost their scholarships. So you have a kind of a, a it, yes, it benefits the higher income families too, but it also can save the program to keep the lower income families getting the scholarships. So this, I mean, this is the inverse of the argument that social security has to go to everybody because yeah. otherwise, if it's just for poor people, people won't support it. Exactly. You yeah. want to structure school choice like social security, but you're Which still saving taxpayer money. Which is a terrible, terrible program. You're still, but yeah. Say, yeah, but yeah. just politically speaking right. to keep it going, uh, you don't want to make it like yeah. food stamps where it's on the cho chopping block. Um, and then... The yeah, the other response to that is look, we tried this incremental stuff before, and we thought that if we just started small and get bigger later, then the unions would shut up. They would stop acting like the sky is falling. Well, that does nothing to they they're at volume eleven no matter what, whether it's one percent mm. of the population or a hundred percent of the population, you might as well mobilize your side to pass the policy because you're not going to do anything to lower the volume on the other side. So it, it is a political calculation, uh, but I, I, it still does disproportionately benefit the least advantaged more than anybody. Thank you. Uh, we're going to do two more questions, so make them brief and uh, question-y. Yeah, it's mostly my fault. I, I answer three yeah. questions. No, 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 don't. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but I, I have to start with a compliment. The, this is uh, just, yeah. th thank you for, for what you're doing. Th this has to be the most important long-term issue for the country. And I know that you favor, uh, you've written that you favor HSA's uh, savings account, yeah, yeah. Ed ed educational savings accounts over vouchers. And uh, I know that Ayn Rand was skeptical of the vouchers. She thought they would lead to government control. 
So I, I wonder how the savings accounts compare to the vouchers and the uh, tax credits in terms it's, it's of more of a government. separation between the government and the end provider because the voucher is basically going directly to the school, whereas the, the funding is going into a savings account directed by the parent. It's much harder to regulate when you're spending it on a mm. bunch of different things. And at the end of the day, we, we, got, we got to be careful not to overthink things. You don't want to make perfect the enemy of the good. Uh, because again, the government can already regulate private and home education. Some people mm -hmm. have said with government shekels comes government shackles. Well, you can get the shackles without the shekels. And this has happened historically. Mm. It's happened in New York City. You had the worst homeschooling laws on the books in New York, according to the HSLDA and their map, Homeschool Legal Defense Association. And they don't have any private school choice programs here. You look at states like Iowa and Oklahoma, they have universal school choice and they have less regulation of homeschooling. And so in Oregon in 1922, they outlawed private education altogether in, in 1922. In 1925, thankfully, the Supreme Court famously ruled that the child is not the mere creature of the state. Some people would be wise to remember those wise no. words today. So let me ask you as a self-professed anarcho-capitalist, why aren't you talking about the separation of state and school? Why are tax dollars chasing anybody? Yeah. This is the this is the easiest policy tweak to make. And mm -hmm. this, you know, look, we're winning on the issue, and maybe we go there next, um, and maybe someone else makes that argument. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I won't fight against you if you do go and advance that argument. It's just going to be a tough lift in state legislatures to 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 call for a total separation of education and state. So it's much easier to say, hey, look. You support all these other initiatives where the funding follows the student or the parent or the family, but then you don't support it for K through 12. And right. then it just exposes them for siding. With and I may uh, also, you, you know, you, you use the metaphor a lot of if you get food stamps, for instance, or, or government, government food assistance, they don't say you can only use it at the corner grocery store. You can go to Walmart, you can yeah. go to Kroger, you can go to wherever. So. Um, that choice in how you spend your money is obviously. Yeah. A, and I'm not it's, it's arguing whether we should or should not have food stamps. I'm arguing that yeah. if we're going to spend the money, it should go to people, not the government. Yeah. So. All right. A okay. Question. Last question. I'm Maude Marin and Corey, as you mentioned, uh, we last saw each other at the moms for Liberty event. So you got a taste of how blue mother Jones reported on that, that event yes. afterwards, right? It's great. <laughs> how blue New York city is and how opposed to some of the policies you support New York city folks are. What I wanted to ask you about is um, you talked about the multiple metrics that can motivate parents on the school you know, choice issue, including um, you know, things beyond standardized tests. One of the issues in New York City that um, is enjoined right now in a very significant way is the gender battle. And sports is a big one. And on your statistics, the, you know, the majority of, of Democrats a, a larger majority of Republicans, but a majority across the board, think that biological males shouldn't participate in girls' sports. I am going to give, I'm going to break the rule, Nick, for one quick second and give a plug because tomorrow night there is a community education council meeting, which is the largest school board in New York City, where we passed in March a resolution asking for a committee to examine the 2019 gender guidelines and said only that we would ask the committee to consider female athletes, coaches, parents, to your book, parents and relevant, you know, uh, medical professionals. It has produced so much rage and fury among the political class in New York, including a letter signed by 18 politicians from Jerry Nadler all, all the way down to city council uh, members because they're calling it hateful, discriminatory, and bigoted to ask for the committee. My question to you, so by the way, anyone who wants to come out, it's at 10 East 15th Street on the Clinton School and there's public speaking session and you can come give your opinion. But my question to you is, how can the school choice agenda be furthered by the fact that across the board politically, so many parents are unhappy with the radical gender policies? Yeah, I mean, look, I would say that is part of the reason why families are motivated to, to, to send their kids somewhere else. And at the end of the day, we also got to be okay with families sending their kids to schools with curriculum that we disagree with, too. Mm. So it goes both ways. And that might be one of the ways you can get some Democrats on board. And actually, I covered this in the Wall Street Journal, too. During the COVID era, uh, we had a survey from Real Clear Opinion Research asking people, Republicans, Democrats, independents, if they would support a voucher if they their public school did not have a mask mandate. And Democrats supported school choice 
because of that. So people mm. support choice. They dis they they might disagree about why that how to about use the reasons that yeah, yeah about why you would want to exercise that choice. Um, but you know they could imagine a, a scenario where they might not agree with the policy too, and and so maybe if you would reframe you, it. Do you think people would uh, parents would also support schools that don't have sports teams? Yeah, as a yeah. alternative. I grew up in a place where it was the Catholic schools that generally really amped up uh, you know sports for a variety of reasons, and uh, you know you could choose not to go to a big sports team. Uh, let me end with uh, one final question for you, uh, Corey DeAngelis, Doctor Corey DeAngelis, PhD. How are teachers not a real doctor responding? Um, yeah. You know, are they are they okay? Like the jigs up, we had a great run. Are they pushing back? And is you know one of the one of the main things that you talk about in the book is how teachers unions have been doing a very bad job of actually representing yeah. teachers yeah. in terms of getting more money and more compensation. So yeah. Yeah. talk a little bit about that. I mean, I talked about earlier how since 1970, okay. per student spending has gone up by 170%. Teacher salaries over the same period have only gone up by about 10%. So the money's not making its way into the classroom. Where is it going? Well, at NCES, they report data from 2000 to today on – the number of students in the system increased by about 7% since 2000. Mm -hmm. The number of administrators in the system increased by 30, 90%. 90%. It's become mm -hmm. more of a jobs program for administrators than an education initiative for kids. And the teachers aren't really seeing the benefit either because a monopoly has no incentive to put that money into the classroom. It's a definition of insanity doing the same thing over and mm -hmm. over again, throwing more money at the, pro at the problem and expecting different results. And with teachers, there actually have been five studies finding that more charter and private school competition, it's not a lot of studies, but it's, it, it is what it is, all five of them finding positive effects on teacher salaries in the public schools too. And so that's because if their employer is not a monopoly anymore, they'll have an incentive to actually spend the money wisely on the teacher. In the Washington Post, anybody like the Washington Post? Me either. Um, mm. uh, they, they, hey, a broken clock. Right? Um, during the COVID era, they wrote an article about a New Jersey public school teacher that had been in the system for decades, left, started a micro school, and they were bragging about how happy they were with it. They had a fraction of the class size, five to 10 children, as opposed to 40 uh, in a class. And they're making it the same amount of money and they had more autonomy, not as much red tape and bureaucracy to deal with. So school choice can benefit teachers too. And there should be a Teachers for Liberty group. We have Moms for Liberty mm. already. We need a Teachers for Liberty so teachers don't feel like they're the only ones fighting back mm. against the status quo too. Final, final question. You went to public grammar school. You went to a public undergrad college. You went to a, a state assisted university for your PhD. Um, I, also drive you, on, I also drive on the roads. Are you a hypocrite? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, also you're drive as, on the roads. You're <laughs> as much of a hypocrite as the people you say who send their kids to private schools but refuse to let people. Do you have, do you have an answer to that, Dr. Corey? Yeah, look, I drive on the roads doesn't mean I think the government should build the roads, right, or, or fund the roads. It's like you live in, this, in the society that you live in. You try to do the best you can with what you have and tweak the system to make it better. And, hey, look, I, 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 I did what I did, and I've gotten as far as I have despite the failures of the school system, not because <laughs> of them. And, look, if, if, maybe if I went to a private school, maybe I'd be doing even better than I am today. But, yeah, right. so, like, and then also, I didn't choose what elementary school I went to, so you can't really hold me to that. Okay, fair enough. We're going to leave it there. This is Corey DeAngelis. He's the author of The Parent Revolution, Rescuing Your Kids from the Radicals Ruining Our Schools. Corey, thanks so much. Thanks, Nick. Thanks.